Good afternoon. My name is Larry Thiel. I'm the director of the Global Affairs Center. Today's topic is coping with conflict. We're going to be reflecting on reflections, some reflections on life in the Palestinian territory and in Southeast Asia. With us today to discuss the topic are two members of the Sherline faculty who have spent extensive times and done a bit of research uh, in these regions. Susan Barclay, right over here to my left, teaches anthropology. Her specialties include peace and conflict studies, violence prevention, humanization, and social change. She spent over 10 years living abroad in places like Guinea, Rain, uh, Reunion Islands, France, Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon doing field re work and working with local communities in theater, film, photography, exhibition, and music. Uh, she completed her graduate work in Beirut, studying social change in the arts as tools for healing in the context of civil conflict. Tim Payne teaches economics here uh, at the college. He's to my left. His interests focus on sustainable development and the power of local organizations to improve the lives of individuals and communities. Some of his early economic research in sustainable agriculture and energy in the Pacific Northwest inspired him to explore principles and practices of sustainability in other parts of the world, uh, including Southeast Asia, Central America, and probably most recently, and in Cuba. His interests include tradition, tradition and modernity in a globalized world and how indigenous knowledge and cultural practices can interplay with science and modern methods of resource management. Uh, so please join me right now in giving a, a welcoming Susan Barclay and Tim Payne. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I want to talk about today, focus on creative strategies that Palestinians are using in the face of the Israeli military occupation. And before we get going, I just want to go over some of the, the definitions or a very elementary framework for this conversation. First of all, even with the title Coping with Conflict, there are many kinds of conflict, and the context really matters. Each context is unique. And today, I'm going to focus on Israel-Palestine as the context. Then also in saying that there are many kinds of conflicts, today I want to focus on conflict that involves physical, psychological, political, and structural violence. Um, structural violence is just another word for inequalities, if you're not familiar with it. And to make sure that everyone understands, kind of, our, we have a definition of violence. I've given you one here from the World Health Organization. The violence is the threat of use or the use of physical force or power against any one or any group that results in injury, death, maldevelopment, deprivation, or harm. So basically, for me as a medical anthropologist specializing in peace and conflict and also looking at health, um, violence harms humans. That's kind of the critical takeaway, right? It's harmful. And violence deconstructs health and wellness. And as I said, I come at this from a, as a, a medical anthropologist, so really caring a lot about health and wellness for human beings. And as a medical anthropologist, I look at health in a multidimensional way, in a holistic way. And when I use that word, I'm talking about really multidisciplinary um, or multidimensional, not holistic, as many of you might think, kind of alternative health, but holistic in the sense that I'm not just thinking about health on a physical level. I'm thinking about health as a physical, a mental, emotional, social, spiritual, economic, political, and environmental balance between all these different dimensions. And that's the lens I'm going to use today to talk about whether or not Palestinians are coping with conflict or how humans may be coping with conflict. So there's a huge range of reactions to violence, ranging from not coping at all, um, really, to healing positively. It's very important to say. And what I'm going to do today is look at this question of coping with conflict. How is that happening? Um, through an examination, really, of is one caring for health in a holistic way, meaning this multidimensional uh, approach. So in other words, to evaluate how people are coping with conflict, we could examine each dimension of health and measure or analyze humans' responses, behaviors, and experiences through this multidimensional platform or perspective. 
So this is a lot of the, I've been studying violence and dehumanization now for over 20 years. Uh, my research shifted halfway through really from dehumanization to start to look at humanization and violence prevention. But these are some of the things in, in working with a lot of people. I'm an anthropologist. I care very much about working with people and being on the ground and um, being in the context in which people are experiencing these kinds of things. So I have worked in a lot of conflict zones, but I've also worked with a lot of people who have lived through violence or experiencing violence. And these are some of the common themes we see with people who have lived through violence. So most people experiencing violence are going to have anger, sadness, fear, shame and guilt, anxiety, stress, pain, hurt, wounds, trauma, alienation, divisions, a lot of internalization of low self-esteem or low self-worth, disempowerment, feeling like a victim, insecurities, all kinds of protective behaviors, lack of trust, and the list goes on and on. Um, but all of these things, although very important, and we could spend the entire quarter actually in class, you know, anthropology of war and peace would be a class that would really look at this in depth. It's not the story I want to talk about today. The story I want to talk about today is really this story, that wherever there is violence, there are all those things I mentioned, definitely. But there is also creative survival and coping and resistance and healing. And the case study that I want to use to animate this particular story about coping with conflict is Israel-Palestine. This is a very complex subject matter, and I could go on and on and giving you a, a history, and I'm not going to do that because I want to get to really more of the creative coping strategies that Palestinians are using to cope with the Israeli military occupation. So I'll just say for today that in 1948, the state of Israel was created. This state um, was created in what was historic Palestine. So prior to 1948, this area was called Palestine. Um, and in 1967, uh, Israel, there was a second war that's called the Six Day War, where Israel took control at that point of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And, um, there are about now three and a half million Palestinians living in the West Bank and about a million and a half living in the Gaza Strip. And Palestinians since 1967 have been living under Israeli military occupation. What does that look like? So where I'm focusing on really is my own experience in doing field work in the city of Nablus that you can see here on the map. I was there for about a year from 2002 to 2003. I also did research in 1999, living in Jerusalem and traveling throughout the region. Um, but these are some of the faces of conflict or violence that I saw myself documented and did field work on um, that are part of the, the military occupation that 200,000 civilians in Nablus deal with every day. So things like checkpoints, roadblocks, curfews, being locked inside their homes for a number of hours or days, sometimes months, um, no freedom of movement, arrest without charge or warrant or legal representation, a policy called administrative detention under the state of Israel. Military operations are ongoing. The use of human shields, so having a Palestinian in front of the Israeli military going door to door to door. Um, destruction of property, house demolitions, this huge wall that's 25 feet um, tall, massive cement structure that has been kind of likened to the Berlin Wall um, that's being built inside the Green Line. All kinds of settlements, land confiscation, bombings, assassinations, closures of schools and neighborhoods, economic strangulation, and basically a context in which the occupying military, the Israeli military, controls and oversees all aspects of life within these territories. So how are people coping with this? Um, and, and by the way, there's nothing, there's no Israeli monopoly on the occupation. An occupation is an occupation. And the United States occupation of Iraq had many of the similar faces or tactics involved in it. Um, but this being said, how are Palestinians coping in, in Nablus, in my experience, with the occupation? Going back to what I want to talk about, which is really this, the creative coping mechanisms people have and some of the more um, you know, amazing ways that people are surviving and healing in this context where uh, life is often incredibly difficult. I want to use this whole lens of holistic health to really examine the creative resistance to and coping with the occupation. And these are some of the examples. If we come back to this holistic lens, which is the physical, emotional, social, environmental, psychological, political, economic, and spiritual health, um, look at the different tactics many Palestinians are using. Um, so on a physical level, 
it's this commitment to movement that continues to happen, that people don't just stop because there is a checkpoint or a roadblock or um, a curfew. People are determined to go out and go to the market, open their stores, go to school. People are also really committed to somehow continuing to get exercise or physical activity despite closures in these kinds of situations, um, to growing food, eating locally, maintaining a healthy diet, is a really important way people manage or cope with the conflict. On an emotional level, there's a very widespread pattern of people expressing their emotions and sharing the pain and suffering that they have, um, telling their stories. I would go all over. I could never, ever get anywhere within Nablus without having a tea or coffee with a Palestinian family or someone who would welcome me into their home and then want to share their story with me. What has happened? Um, and then crying, something that I saw a lot in public, not something that people felt ashamed of, but that actually was very appropriate response to um, the, some of the, the things that they're experiencing, being angry and being willing to be vulnerable. So all of these things to me are actually signs of kind of healthy ways to cope with conflict. Um, you can also read each thing I'm saying, read backwards to say that if we were not coping with conflict, these things would not be there. And then on a social level, um, this is something that I think is very, very strong within the Palestinian occupied territories, but the importance of the community, of family, of friends, and spending time with people is so, so important, and it really keeps people's spirits, I think, lightened by, um, by being together. A lot of greetings and visiting each other, eating together, having coffee and teas throughout the entire um, region and, and the Middle East, really a, a fundamental part about hosting. And then an environmental level, I'm going to show you a bunch of photos in a minute of these things. Rebuilding homes and roads, caring for the space is a really important way of resisting some of the destruction that happens. On a psychological level, Palestinians refusing to see themselves as victims. Um, this is a really important psychological kind of perspective to have, keeping a positive perspective, learning and stimulating their minds, and having hope. And political level, there's framing of the struggle within Israel-Palestine as a just struggle, and then a lot of analysis of the power dynamics, empowered active stances, and strong identity creation. So coming back again and again, these are different tactics that you could see that people, helps them keep them in a position of greater power and agency. And then economically, there's been lots of movements by Palestinians not to pay taxes. Um, this kind of idea of struggling or hustling, like getting by, finding a way to continue to survive, despite the fact that there's economic strangulation. The city is being cut down or shut off, as I witnessed in Nablus when I was there for many months. Um, people pool their resources, they stock up on a lot of things, and they support, wherever possible, other Palestinians or businesses. And then a spiritual level, also a lot of um, importance on prayer and quiet and also play, meaning, have finding meaning, believing in truth, and building solidarity. So just give you a couple stories to animate these lenses and then stop. Um, on a physical level here, you have a couple examples of some of the photos and the ways that Palestinians in the area of Nablus and the surrounding villages have really worked. On the left-hand side, there are over 99, about 100 fixed checkpoints within the West Bank. Um, and then there are also all kinds of checkpoints or roadblocks that are built that are um, temporary. And Palestinians manage to continue to constantly try their best to go where they have to go. I'm talking here about just the civilians trying to go about their daily business, um, some examples. And then on a social level, making life continue, one of the first things that I was asked to participate in as an international coming into Nablus was asked with other internationals, and I should say, one of the things that happens within the, um, in this context is that internationals have a degree of being seen as outsiders. By many Israeli soldiers, I was seen as assumed to be definitely on their side or a friend um, because I'm US American and the United States has been very supportive. We give the, the most aid to Israel, more aid to Israel than any other country. So it's kind of assumed to definitely be on their side. And this gave me a level of protection where Israeli soldiers very rarely open fire on me immediately. Um, it also meant I could use that protection or that inequality, that advantage to help minimize human rights abuses 
And so one of the things we were asked to do was actually accompany a bride from a village just outside of Nablus into the city to the Balata refugee camp so that a wedding could take place. And Palestinians said, we want the rituals that define us, that keep us alive, that make us human to go on, to happen. And we need to do this. It's an act of resistance. Um, and then innovation also. This is just an example of cars. I remember the first time in Nablus, there was about a three-month curfew when I was there in 2002, June, July, August. Um, that was enforced really with a, a extreme use of violence. Um, and then when the curfew was finally stopped being uh, enforced because people went to school, uh, the next tactic that the Israeli military began to use was the confiscation of keys of cars of drivers. And the first time that I was stopped, I was headed from one side of the city to the other side. I was in a, a shared taxi-ish route. And the Israeli military jeep just pulled around a corner. Soldiers were out of that jeep immediately with M16s pointed towards us in the car. I got out, it was with the driver. Um, and the, the soldiers then took off, took uh, this gentleman's keys and left with those keys. And I was thought we were stuck and said to the driver, like, this is so terrible, we're stuck, let's wait. We don't know how long. I had been involved in many of these instances where you don't know how long you'll wait for the soldiers to come back. And the driver just took out of his pocket a second copy of the keys and was like, yalla, let's go. Um, <laughs> So very creative kind of possibilities. That's really cool. And within a week, literally in the city of Nablus, everyone was making these duplicates. And it was just so neat to see that tactic change. So here you have a tank in the background of these three cars. All these drivers are just on the sidelines. The second that tank pulls back, the drivers are going to come grab their cars and take off. Um, and then an emotional level, here's a family I met. When I first walked into Balada refugee camp, this family just immediately was able to say, we're scared, we're really scared. They thought that the Israeli army would maybe come to demolish their home. They had um, two brothers here that were within an age where they could be potentially just arbitrarily arrested by the state of Israel. Um, and uh, we're able to reach out and say, please, we would feel safer if an international were staying with us or if someone would be here. Um, so an example of storytelling and kind of sharing that. And then to the right of that is a village protest that I was able to just be a part of where you have Israeli soldiers on the right hand side and um, this community, they're whole passage into the city of Nablus had been gutted, which you can see this massive trench, and a D9 bulldozer dug that trench. I watched it happen from the hill um, to cut off the, the village areas from the city of Nablus. And what this effectively did is let, meant that the entire village was imprisoned. So no people could in any way use car as a mode of transportation to move from the village to the city, which meant that any old people who needed to go to the hospital could not be transported. How do you carry someone over this, children, no vegetables or produce was able to be transported into the city market. And so what happened in this village is that they decided they wanted to talk to the soldiers, closest soldiers to them, who were occupying a civilian home, and they came down, and this gentleman who's just gesturing here is very eloquently saying to the soldiers, you know, we're human just like you. How would you feel if you were treated like this? Really expressing his story in a very powerful way. And the soldiers could not respond. I mean, the most common response soldiers would say were, we don't want to be here either. This is not our choice. Um, but we have to do this. But they did engage in an exchange for a while and said, we have orders. We need to do this, et cetera. And then ultimately ended up ending the conversation. And then during that summer, when Nablus was closed for about three months straight, every single day, um, no one of 200,000 people, no one other people were allowed to go outside. And this was enforced through the military jeeps and tanks cruising around the city, firing live rounds of ammunition. Um, but one of the acts that people did, as I told you, they're determined to keep movement and life happening. And this is such a powerful part of humans, I think, that, that even in the face of conflict, we do this. We survive. We find a way. Um, but the Palestinians in Balada refugee camp here decided they wanted one day of just a couple hours of normalcy for the children. And they asked, again, um, many of the local associations and organizations to get some money together to get all the kite building materials. And we came together, and the children made kites for a couple hours in the morning and then moved out into the field behind Balata refugee camp. We could hear tanks on the outskirts firing sporadic live rounds of ammunition. They never came into the camp or into this area. And the children just took this stance of we're, we're going to have a couple hours of play and joy. Um, and it was a really beautiful thing to see. <clears throat> 
excuse me. And then on a psychological level, one of the most powerful stories I could tell about this, oh, no, I need to close up here, is just about resistance, really, and school. Um, after Annapolis had been closed for three months, so literally no one um, allowed outside 24 hours a day, uh, there was actually, I should say, during that period of time, the Israeli military did open the city for a period total during that period of time of less than a week for usually it would be a couple hours at certain times. So about every 10 days, open the city for about four hours and people would go out, get everything they could and then go back home. Um, I went around and saw the various officials in the city before school was gonna start and asked them, so is anyone gonna go to school? The governor, the mayor, the various principals of the schools and none of them were willing to encourage the civilians to break curfew and go to school because they felt like if someone got injured or killed, they would be blamed. And so what was really amazing to witness at this period of time for myself was the first day of school I woke up, I was in Oscar refugee camp, um, sleeping in a family's home who felt that they were in some way at risk or was scared of maybe their home being demolished. Um, and I woke up to the sound of 80 millimeter live rounds of ammunition being fired. So really big rounds that make this very loud reverberating sound through the city, um, telling everyone, this was at about 4.30 in the morning, that don't think about going to school the risk of going to school is that is this level of intense intensity or violence and I got up to the west side of Nablus at about 6 37 in the morning and remember one of the first scenes I saw that brought tears to my eyes was an older gentleman probably about 50 years old or so stepping out onto the sidewalk with a eight-year-old or a nine-year-old a young boy and Two sons, you know, one maybe five or six, and one eight or nine, both in uniform. And he's holding their hands, and they're walking down the sidewalk. And then another family, and another family, and another family, until this whole city of people decided they were going to school. Um, this is about noon, the center photo. Noon on the first day that the school was opened by the people, not by any officials or any leaders. Um, and these are students clearly in uniform walking down to the refugee camps across the city of Nablus. I'm about to witness a tank come up. The gunner will literally make eye contact with me and then begin to fire live rounds of ammunition right over all these students' heads who will scream and yell and go in all these different directions. Um, and that was you know, one occurrence of many that day that I ran into where soldiers were being given orders to shut down the city, to maintain the curfew, and to close the schools. And this meant things like tear gassing schools, um, you know, detaining and, and holding uh, resting students. Students were injured. You can see the, the smoke coming out of the tank turret here at the bottom. Um, so an incredible period of time, and yet what Palestinians hold on to is you have to resist. You have to go to school. You have to keep stimulating your mind and, and doing this, even without leadership, we will find a way. And what's amazing is Nablus did that for about 10 days, went to school, there were many, many people injured and killed during that period of time in the city, and at the end of 10 days, the Israeli military pulled out of the city and um, went to the outskirts and um, lifted the curfew. Uh, am I at time? Should I just stop here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. I will. Thanks, Larry. Isn't she great? You guys should... I, I want to take her class. I hope you do too. Um, conflict, as Susan said, takes a lot of different forms. And um, I'm going to be looking at this. I'm an economist. You've heard an anthropological viewpoint now on conflict. I'm going to look at this from more of an economics viewpoint. And I'm focusing on NGOs. If you're not familiar with the term, these are non-governmental organizations. This is something other than government. It's something other than a business uh, that um, come in and try to address conflict with organizations and institutions. You've probably heard of some of these international NGOs, like the United Nations, for example, is very big. There are also very small NGOs. They could be charities. They could be churches. They could be local organizations that work with local people. And that's really what I'm focusing on, is these locally-based institutions that focus on very local needs that could be very different depending on where you are in the world and the situation. Um, my background, by the way, in economics is not so much in conflict. This is a relatively new area of study for me. Most of my background has been on the environment, on natural resources. And my, my viewpoint has always been, uh, we humans have made a mess. We need to clean it up. 
we make messes with conflicts too. And sometimes I think we need to clean up our mess. My study here is going to focus on just one thing that I did earlier this year in February and March. I was looking at a conflict that supposedly ended over 40 years ago in the Lao People's Democratic Republic, otherwise known as Laos. Here's a map of Laos. You can see it's uh, in Southeast Asia, located between Vietnam and Thailand. It's a landlocked country. Um, that location ended up creating a conflict for Laos back in 1964 to 73. The United States was in a war in Vietnam. Laos is not Vietnam, but we did a lot of bombing. Every little red dot on this map represents a bombing mission, one airplane dropping a load of bombs. And you can see that we, we covered that country with bombs. They were not in the war. This is sometimes called the secret war. Um, I think we could also call it illegal. Uh, a lot of the world did, by the way. Now, a lot of the bombs that were dropped are a bomb called a cluster bomb. You can see there's this kind of missile-looking thing, but inside it, there's all these little balls. They're called bomblets, an individual bomb. These things, the one bomb missile has about 800 of these bomblets. You can see they're about the size of an orange. Each one of these is explosives and shrapnel in them, and we dropped them all over Laos. Here's a little statistics for you. 2 million tons of ordnance. That's 580,000 bombing missions. That's half a million missions, the equivalent of a plane load every eight minutes for nine years. Um, there were 270 million of these bomblets dropped. About 80 million failed to detonate. About a one-third failure rate um, on those. Those are still there. They still haven't exploded until someone comes in contact with them. The conflict is continuing. These are sometimes called unexploded ordnance or UXOs. They've killed as many as 50,000 civilians in Laos, 20,000 after the war ended, and again, the war they weren't in. Um, this is leaving a serious impact on a country where so many people, this is how many have been killed. Uh, the survivors oftentimes are surviving life with serious injuries and disabilities. Uh, losing arms, legs, hands, feet, eyes, and it changes people's lives economically. We certainly talked about how it affects them psychologically, socially, um, but economically in a country where you depend on your physical work to have a job to support your family, these people can now not, not now do normal traditional physical work. They cannot support a family, they become dependent on their family, and their status in society just goes down. They become very marginalized. And in a society where it's very close-knit community, that can be devastating, just that loss of prestige and, and standing in society. So what's being done? I want to get to some of the positives on this. There, there are local NGOs that are working on addressing this issue in various ways. I could tell you stories that we don't have time for about a lot of the good work being done. I'm going to focus on one organization and what they did. Um, this is called the Lao Disabled Women's Development Center. And they are working with women that have the disabilities, the lost limbs um, from these unexploded ordnance. And how are they working with them? We'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, they've got a mission. Um, this is from their own mission statement. They start with women as agents of change, that empowering women can create community development, can create change in the community in a positive way. Uh, all of this is community-based. and. It's, it's, I think, admirable that their mission is about building peace when they were the victims of a war they weren't even in. I, th I think they're coming out of it with a positive attitude. They're focusing on health, wellness, and addressing uh, how, to, how to improve the lives of people with disabilities, and they're doing it through education, through training, and business development. This is where I come into this as an economist. Um, I could tell you a little bit about what they're doing. They are doing medical care and rehab for people that have been injured. 
Um, they're uh, providing artificial limbs uh, for people who have lost limbs. And uh, this is an early stage component of what this organization does. Their training and education is how do you get people retrained to do jobs that require arms and legs? They have a training center for women and they're training them how to, uh, well in this case, do weaving and sewing. Uh, and it takes a while. I, I couldn't imagine how can you run a sewing machine running fabric through it with one hand. They're, they're training them how to do it. And not only do they get the job training, they're also giving them business training. At the same time they learn a skill, they're also learning some knowledge. How can I open a tailoring business in my village or my community so I can start serving the community and be a business person in the community? This is a huge raise in their economic status, giving them this opportunity. This is uh, some of the businesses that they're learning how to create. This, these are garments and tapestries that they've made and they've learned how to make and then they're selling them. Another thing that I think is uh, important about these locally based NGOs is that they use local people to address local problems. Um, the staff are, are local people and the women that work at this center are also disabled women. They have gotten the training, they are modeling something for other women to achieve. That you too can raise up and help other people help themselves. There is international support here. This is one of my favorite people here at the, at the center. And on the, the left is an Australian volunteer. And the Australian government has provided some support for organizations like this. And I, again, was another international volunteer working with them. Well, I got a quick story for you here. And this story was I just happened to be there on graduation day. And this is where the women that have gone through this training program, it's a residential program, they have dormitories, they stay there and live there for about nine months taking their classes in business and in various training. This was graduation day and it was a big deal for those graduates that they now have the skills and they're gonna be able to go back in their community and get going with their lives. Um, yeah, it was a, everybody, of course, got certificates, and there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of ceremony involved in this. They're big into ceremony. Yeah, there was music and dancing, and people gave very long speeches, um, all part of the big ceremony. Um, what I think a lot of them didn't know was that there was going to be something happening in this graduation ceremony with international aid from organizations like in Australia and one I was working with. We gave them a little help. Each of the graduates got a brand new sewing machine. And this was a surprise to them. Um, it was, this is a life changer for people that have nothing coming into it. Now they've got skills, they know how to start a business, and they've got capital to get going. And so it was a pretty big deal for them. And it, was, it still moves me to just think about what was going on here to change people's lives on a very small scale, very local. I want to just give you a little bit, in a very short amount of time, of, of how I was involved and how international involvement happens here. I was working with an organization called Clear Path International, or CPI. They're based on Bainbridge Island. And they're an example of uh, something that's happening a lot around the Puget Sound area and the Seattle area where we have many, many of these locally based NGOs. They're located here in Seattle, but then they do work all around the world, oftentimes with these local organizations. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is probably the most famous, but there are many smaller ones and this is one that's included. And I went on with them as a volunteer and advisor, and that's how I got going on this. They get some funding from the U.S. State Department, from the European Union, and from private donors. Um, that's where they get the money. That's where we got the money for the sewing machines and some of the work that they do. Uh, these international organizations will go to those local ones and give them various kinds of assistance and support. It could just be money, it could be technical assistance, it could be advising, it could be training. And so there's, there's a partnership that happens. By the way, if you wanted to look at their website, uh, cpi.org. Um, here's my conclusion on this. A little bit of the economics here. 
Right now, the U.S. contributes about two to two and a half million dollars a year, primarily through the State Department for organizations like the Lao Development Center that I showed you. About two and a half million a year. Uh, when we were bombing them, we were spending 13 million a day for nine years. Um, I just kind of question whether our response is uh, appropriate and of the magnitude needed. Um, what you can do, if you'd like to do something about it, get a hold of your congressman and tell him to spend at least $10 million. This is the estimate of it would be enough to continue the things like I showed you and to make, make them, well, again, continuous, but to support everybody that does need the support. It, there is more that's needed. Um, that's my presentation of one little story about one little NGO. Thanks. Uh, Susan, uh, this is, question is from Ruth and I from St. Mark's Cathedral. The recent events in uh, Jerusalem are, are shocking, and I'm, I've been to uh, the West Bank, and I just question how can the, I mean, your presentation is stellar, but what would you say in terms of the responses now after, you know, the events since 1948, and how to keep going in terms of the steadfast hope? Thank you. That's a very complex question, right, You're trying to figure this out. Um, but one thing I think that the U.S. media fails to do completely is give us the context of the background, basically, the Israeli military occupation. That's the context for a lot of what we're seeing. So I think until the occupation is dealt with, there won't be a solution. Um, and that's something, you know, that is a very complex thing to take on, but certainly these cycles of violence can just be expected to continue until really the roots of what the issues are, which I think is this end of the occupation that, that Palestinians and many Israelis feel that they want to, to bring an end to. And then the idea of a two-state solution is still the most popular solution amongst Palestinians and Israelis. And I think getting more political officials who are really invested in creating peace, all of those would be positive things. Um, but I'm totally with you. I mean, it is such a complex situation and heartbreaking. Um, and just as a side for everyone remembering to humanize all the people, that this is really about equality for all the people in the land and equal rights for everyone in the land. Hi. Do you think the root cause of the cycles of violence come from, stem from ignorance or a form of Islamophobia? Um, you know, I wouldn't say that for me, again, this is it's such a complex uh, topic. This could be something that we would look at for a long time. But I think it's more an issue of, um, you know, land in the beginning and less a religious conflict. Right now, these most recent issues have been very religiously charged and people are looking at this as a kind of religious spin. But I think for most people, it's more an issue kind of of land and whose land will this area be? And um, Palestinians feel that historically it was their land. Um, many Jews feel that historically they have a claim to the land as well. And then this kind of battle or conflict over who gets to have which part of the land. So for me, it's more an issue of that than it is a religious issue, but religion plays a part. Hi, my question is for you as well, Susan. Um, in this society, I feel, or at least here in the West, we're kind of programmed to be afraid, like fear, fear, consume, consume. Don't look over here, look at this. How best can we combat that as individuals? Well, that's a great question, too. I mean, all of these feel so much more complex than we had the time to possibly address in this very short um, time. But, you know, I think one of the things you're doing is you're getting informed. You know, you're here educating yourselves. And that's such a powerful, radical act in my mind is just to, to learn more and be really curious and try to look at things from different points of view. And when you, for myself, when I feel like fear tactics are being used, it raises my skepticism very high. I go right to wait a minute, 
and I want to ask more questions about like, well, what will this, where will this end us? You know, where will we end up if we go down this path? Um, because fear is so often used as a tool of control, I am very skeptical of it, and it sounds like you are too. So just having that and then trying to get, I think, educated, different, different perspectives, seeing um, outside the United States media is a really critical thing as well to go to other sources. Hi, uh, my question is, um, what's being done to prevent these acts before it happens? Uh, it seems the United States uh, is giving a million dollars of aids uh, to Pakistan, which in return uh, produce terrorists uh, in th different forms, and also a country like Israel uh, giving billion dollars of aid to them, and they're clearly committing genocide, uh, So, and yet we're worried about ISIS and what's going on there. So what are we doing uh, as a nation uh, to prevent uh, these things from happening? Thank you. I might start that. Um, one thing I'd, I would mention is I, I am an economist, but I also teach in our international studies program. International studies is a broader study that includes economics, politics, history, geography. And when I hear a question like this, sometimes it, it's bigger. Uh, I would say what, what we're doing is not enough. I would say one, one thing that we could do differently, if, if we are giving aid to countries, that there should be some conditions on that aid. If you want our money, then you need to do this or you need to change this or quit doing that and, and use that as an incentive. And that's a way economists look at things, that make, make an incentive for change. And, and if the change doesn't happen, the aid gets pulled back. And maybe if somebody else is doing something that is, let's say, more appropriate, maybe the aid increases to them as a positive incentive. Um, so, our, And this gets into what we call foreign policy, which is more Larry's field of study in, in political science, that our foreign policy, our relations with other countries, maybe need to be based on higher principles than oil. And um, I just kind of throw that out there because I'm an economist. Um, what I wanted to, to go back and add to what Susan said earlier about this. I do think education is the key. I think opening our eyes and our minds, being open to different points of view, looking at different forms of media. I would also throw in there getting out once in a while. Like go out and see some of the world. Get yourself out of your, your limitations of your own experience and surroundings and it will raise your awareness. It's another form of education. Not every, everyone can travel, not everybody can do study abroad, but take the opportunities when they exist. And we have that at Shoreline Community College, and I'm proud we do. I don't know if that answered all of your question. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Rami Kreis. I am from Jordan, and I am visiting. And I would like just to add to what you said to the good two ladies here. I would like to remind you about six years ago, an Israeli settler from Khalil, Hebron, have entered one mosque and shot 378 people who were praying. About 200 of them died. The rest, they were all injured and taken to hospitals. About 100 of them died, and only 78 survived. Again, this is also is a shame as bad as what has taken place a place yesterday in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And I and my daughter who's sitting behind me, we went to Israel three months ago trying to visit and see what is happening next door. And we were not being able to cross the blockades to go to the West Bank, although we have family there from her mother's side. I'm a full-blooded Jordanian, but <laughs> from her mother's side, who is a Palestinian, we couldn't go see their relatives. So yes, I, I sympathize. It's a pathetic thing what has taken place. But again, I think the, the answer to all of that is a true justice, two, two states. And this is what everybody is saying, and it is the most popular solution. Thank you. So um, I, I feel like the, the topic being discussed is really important, but I did have a, a question more for you. Um, so with the bombs that are left, 
Um, are there, is there anything being done to clean those up? I mean, is, it, is there government involvement or is the NGOs or are they just there? Good question. Um, the organization I was with is named Clear Path and their first step is to clear the path, which means go out and find those bombs and get rid of them so they're not there to explode on somebody. This, when they're, what was it, I think 80 million that were left unexploded, they're not easy to find. Um, the statistic I heard on this since the war, about 1% have been defused so far. This is a big job. It's one of the first things this organization does. By the way, I was not out there clearing bombs. <laughs> I, was, I come in at the end of it, and my, what I was doing and this is, again, not answering your question, but I want you to see that this is a very, it, it's a long process. I'm at the very end of it as an economist saying, is all this money spent paying back? Is it paying back with people, their health improving, their lives improving, their family income improving, their communities improving? Is the money a good investment that our State Department gives them? Because my goal was if I can show it's a good investment, that's one argument that we can give to our Congress people to give more. Um, how much is being done on it again? And there's work being done, but it's a long process. Uh, this organization, by the way, is involved not just in Laos. Uh, they were dealing with some of the mess of the Vietnam War in both Cambodia and in Vietnam. In Cambodia, it's landmines, which do the same thing. In, in Vietnam, it's Agent Orange which was a chemical that we used to spray to kill the forest so the enemy wouldn't have any place to hide. Well, the chemical is a carcinogen, and it creates all kinds of health problems in communities that are still suffering from it. There is work trying to clean up. It's just a long process. That war's over, but the damage is not. What efforts are being made in those Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, legally to uh, force the U.S. to provide more help to ameliorate the problems that were created. Uh, you're, are you asking what efforts in those countries are being done to, uh, to influence our, our government? What legal avenues are available to force the U.S. to assume the responsibility they have for having dropped all those weapons and, and uh, chemicals? It's a good question, and here's where I claim a little bit of ignorance. I'm an economist, not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer, and those legal avenues, especially when it gets to international law, it would probably take an international law expert to, to answer the question, what can another country do to make us clean up our mess? Um, and so I don't have an answer on that. Uh, I was, some of the work that I was doing was related to work that the Laotian government had done. And what they were doing was just trying to get some numbers on things. You know, how many people need help? How many, how much does it cost to help them? Uh, get some numbers on it so we could at least have, here's a checklist of what is needed. Um, but ultimately, they, the Laotian government has very little influence on our politicians. Uh, they usually look to us citizens and say, talk to your government. You can influence your government. We can't. And I, I sometimes will hear this when I travel to other countries. I've heard this before. Tell your government to change their policies. You probably heard it in Palestine, too. And my first response when people told me this years ago is I would say, you really are overestimating our power as individual Americans to influence our own government. My tune has changed on that. We have a lot more power than they do. We just don't necessarily exercise it. Um, if we get more educated, if we get more involved, if we really start asking, that might be the power that is out there to change our policies and what our government does. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Payne. <laughs> um, I really, I, I want to affirm that because if you don't speak up, your voice will not be heard. And um, our country will continue to terrorize and destabilize and occupy as we have in the Middle East. And as Susan was saying before, 
um, about the need to um, to have a strong identity. When we think about ISIS, when we think about ISIL, these are things that have happened since our government went in and started tearing up the Middle East and and supporting aggressors. And so. Um, we have to make our voices heard. Write your senators, write your representatives, and let them know that you see what's going on and you don't like it. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. It's more of a comment inside of a question, but why is it that the Australian government took the lead on um, and took the initiative with the people in Laos to help with you know, cleaning up the mess that we made? And why aren't more NGOs like the one that you are partnering with, American NGOs, doing more to take responsibility for what our government did? As, as the comments have come forward, we need to take the responsibility and take ownership and, and be proactive. Yes, we may be one person, but as a collective we, we can get more done. And I, I think that we as Americans, because we, started this mess, we should clean it up. Well, you heard my attitude on that, and it's the same. Um, it was kind of embarrassing when I was over there. You know, and again, I'm volunteering, and I'm trying to help, but to see that there's Europeans there that are doing more than Americans, that there are Australians there doing more than Americans. Um, we, I, we worked a little bit with the uh, Physicians Without Borders, which if you, maybe you've heard of some of their work, they're, they're French-based. And no, they didn't create the mess. They just see the need that's not being filled, and so they've stepped in. And why? Well, I guess there's a different attitude. Um, and this, again, gets into an area outside of my field of study. It makes economic sense to me, but it maybe doesn't make political sense to our politicians that make decisions on how to, how to spend our tax money. And a lot of times, this is how, how the debate gets framed. Do you really want to have your taxes raised? Uh, we got one volunteer right here. <laughs> it's got to come from somewhere. And uh, I, I will say that the uh, NGOs uh, get funding from many sources. And as I said, this NGO got a lot of their funding from governments, from our State Department and from the European Union. But there are also private donors out there that are seeing a need and seeing that governments are not doing enough. And so there are many ways that you can get involved. I was donating time. I went and volunteered. So there's many ways that you can be involved in it. I would totally agree. I just want to say also the politicalization, like becoming politicized, because the United States is so depoliticized. It's just being here and seeing you all, wanting, caring about the subject matter, becoming more informed. It really matters that more U.S. Americans know and then definitely take the step, another step of advocating or asking for some kind of change. And the fundamental thing for me as an anthropologist is just the equality of all humankind and standing up for that time and time and time again. Okay, uh, I hope that everyone's enjoyed Susan and Tim's remarks. I think you have. And uh, let's please give them another round of applause. Thank you very much.